So welcome everybody to our online kickoff event of the lecture series, International Perspectives on the Study of Racism, Definitions, Concepts, Measures, with Professor Fatima El Tayeb. My name is Gian Sinanolo. I am the head of the Office of the National Monitoring of Discrimination and Racism at the Dezim Institute. We are extremely honored and pleased to have Professor Fatima El Tayeb with us today. And before I hand over to Dr. Noah Ha, our scientific director, who will introduce Professor El Tayeb and moderate the discussion, I want to say a couple of words about the idea, the aim, and the content of the lecture series. The term and the concept of racism has only recently been fully acknowledged in German society. While talk of racism has been common in radical movements for the past two decades, it was largely avoided in academia and mainstream politics. A series of violent racist and anti-Semitic attacks in the cities of Halle and Hanau, and ultimately the impact of the Black Lives Matter movement in Germany after the killing of George Floyd in the US brought about a radical shift. In light of these events and under the pressure of uh, many communities and civil um, rights organizations, the federal government has asked the Dezim Institute, among others, to shed light on the scale of racism in Germany from a scientific point of view. Our task is to provide data about the causes, extent and consequences in, of racism in our society. This task, however, presents a dilemma. As much as our societies and moreover the communities who suffer from racism urgently need scientific evidence, the positivi positivistic notion that one could measure racism seems to be contested. Against this background, we want to discuss with internationally renowned scholars some of the complications and complexities in the study of racism. The lecture series deals with current aspects and challenges of international racism re research in order to reflect and discuss the translatability and understanding of racism through dialogue. The close interweaving of racism with the history of colonialism in a global perspective also points to the different developments in different countries, the great differences in the transferability of categorical understandings, measurements, and quantitative measurements of racist attitudes, discrimination, experiences, and consequences. Therefore, the lecture series is intended to invite international scientists to comprehend racism in a complex manner, in its individual, institutional, structural, and social dimension, in order to shed light on racism from a global perspective and a particular challenge in Germany. I wish us all an exciting discussion and hand over to Dr. Noah Ha. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gian, for the warm welcoming here. Also from my side, welcome everybody who I can see you out there on your monitors. Um, and I also would like to say um, you're very honored and uh, very happy to welcome Professor Fatima El Tayeb. Uh, for her lecture, the first lecture in the series here. Fatima El Tayeb is Professor of Literature and Ethnic Studies at the University of California, San Diego. Her work deconstructs structural racism in colorblind Europe and centers strategies of resistance among racialized communities, especially those that politicize culture through an intersectional queer practice. She is the author of three books. Schwarze Deutsche, Rasse und Nationale Identität, 1890 bis 1933. European Others, Queering Ethnicity in Postnational Europe, which is also translated into German. And Undeutsch, Die Konstruktion des Anderen in der Postmigrantischen Gesellschaft. And numerous articles on the interaction of race, gender, sexuality, religion and nation. She is active in black feminist, migrant, and queer of colors organizations in Europe and the US. And I also would like to emphasize that Fatima El Tayeb is an historian, which I think is an important discipline to 
think about race and racism in various contexts. She brought a lecture with the title, Things are Different Here, on the urgency of comparative studies of global racial capitalism. So welcome to Fatima el -Tayef. Hello. So actually, this is a moment where everybody is applauding. We don't have like the huge hall where everybody is seeing you and we could applaud. Um, it's an honor to have you here. So the floor is yours to give you uh, to give the lecture and to the audience i would like uh, to inform you that there is a possibility to um, bring in your <laughs> questions you can either send an email to this email address which you can see right now on your screen but as well <laughs> there's a possibility to enter your question in the live chat of the youtube um, the question will be all screened and hand over to me. So after the dis after the lecture, we will come into uh, uh, a conversation with Fatima El Tayeb. So the floor is your Fatima. We are looking forward to your lecture and see you later again to having a conversation. Okay, uh, thank you so much, um, Noah. And I want to um, emphasize that I totally agree with uh, with. The what Noah just said, it's, it's a little bit weird to um, kind of talk into the void. So please um, don't be shy and ask any questions that you might have. I'd be more, more than happy to, to answer them. Um, but first, I want to I wanna thank Noah, Jihan, and all of Desim for organizing this and, and for inviting me. I'm really honored to be giving the first lecture in this important series. And I believe what um, what I'll be talking about is uh, mostly in line with the first set of, of questions Tian raised, namely, why is research into racism so problematic? And what role does the evidence of race play in the US context in contrast to Europe? And as uh, someone who studies race in, in Europe and in Germany in particular, and who teaches at a US university, I'm of course well aware that the question if and how theories of racialization are translatable between different contexts, both in terms of geography and history, is a very contested one. And I do have an opinion on that. I believe that a comparative approach to processes of racialization is not only possible, but necessary. My own work, broadly speaking, is situated in the field of comparative diaspora studies with a focus on continental Europe, in particular on the intersections between African, Roma, and Muslim diasporas, and methodologically is grounded in transnational feminism, queer diaspora studies, and queer of color critique. And in, in what follows, I will try to summarize why I believe that in order to understand the workings of racism in any one place, we always need a comparative lens. But to give you a very short version right away, race and racism are global structural principles of modernity. They originated from Europe and have permeated every part of the world under its influence. So while it is important to study national and local and regional implementation of these principles, we will necessarily fail to grasp their full impact and the reasons for their persistence. If we don't, do not put these observations into the larger context in which they already exist. Before I try to provide some answers, I want to remind us, however, that these questions are not purely academic, not even primarily so. The transnational circulation of knowledge and practices, often though not always originating in the United States, has long been a key survival strategy of racialized communities in Europe, from hip hop to Black Lives Matter and before that. In part, this is due to the nature of diasporas, which transcend national contexts connected by shared histories and positionality. And in part, it is due to the suppression of minoritized knowledge in these national contexts. By that, I mean both that the knowledge that local communities of color produce is ignored by mainstream society, 
until it is appropriated, as for example, in the current debate on German colonialism, which largely raises the work of black activists. Okay, I think now this happened, what we were talking before, that it might happen that the lecturer, that Fatima Elta, yep, now she's back. Yeah, I'm back. Yes, we, we lost you for a moment. You were just starting about talking about black knowledge in the context of the post-colonial debate here in Germany and about local knowledge. And uh, then we lost you. Yeah. Well, um, I don't know what happened. I hope it won't happen again, but um, if so, we are prepared. So what the, the point I was trying to make is that for communities of color, um, transnational discourse was always essential, in part because diasporas are transnational, but also because certainly in the case of Europe, and or to speak of Germany in particular, the knowledge that communities of color produce is often ignored. And one example for that is the current academic debate and political debate around um, the German colonial legacy, which really I think is happening because of the decades long work of activists of color, but that work is often completely ignored in that debate. And in addition, the vast amount of scholarship produced by racialized academics in the US and the Caribbean is often completely ignored in Germany, even in the fields devoted to the study of racism. So obviously no one can call themselves an expert in German literature without ever having read Goethe, but there are far too many white German so-called experts on racism who've never heard of Cedric Robinson, CLR James, or Sylvia Winter. And this is a structural problem rooted in the very system that is being studied. And I'll say more on that later. As is true for many Euro other Europeans of color, intersectionality or critical race studies are not concepts I discovered recently through academic debates or in seminars when I was a student in Germany. And I certainly did not learn about Audrey Lord, Sata Shakur, or Gloria Anseldua from my exclusively white professors. Though I have to give a shout out to the public library in my hometown of 10,000 people, which had a good number of books on the US civil rights and black liberation movements, though much less on the anti-colonial writings originating in Europe's former colonies in Africa and Asia or actually not all former colonies when I was a teenager. And to go on a brief tangent, this was not coincidental. It was and is easier for white Europe to learn about and sympathize with the black liberation struggle in the US than with the anti-colonial struggles in the global South. Colonialism is still an open wound for Europe, despite or maybe because of its almost complete expulsion from the continental consciousness. And um, I'll say more about that later as well. So back to topic, I learned of US-based theorists and practitioners of anti-racism through a transnational circuit that has connected black people for centuries. For me and for many others like me, participating in this exchange, having access to a global African diaspora was literally life-saving, and I'm not exaggerating here. To have a language, to have concepts to validate one's own experience in an environment in one's very existence is denied is not an academic question. Let's not forget that the stakes are not, are not the same for all of us. Racism is a matter of life and death. It is a matter of the unequal distribution of life and death. And I'm not only talking about black men being murdered by a police force trained to see them not as humans, but as predators, or about accepting the avoidable death of thousands of Africans each year at Europe's borders, 
Africans whose lives Europeans have been trained to see as less valuable than their own. I'm also talking about the cumulative effect of structural racism on the physical and mental health of racialized populations. To give you one example, studies in the US have shown that medical students believe that black people are less sensitive to pain than other groups. And that belief directly affects not only what medications doctors prescribe, but also how seriously they take symptoms described by black patients. Other studies have shown that even if all factors are equal, economic status, prior medical history, and so on, black patients receive lower quality care than white patients. I, for example, thanks to my class privilege, that is a job that comes with health insurance, can see good doctors, which already makes me an exception among racialized people who are disproportionately stuck in low wage jobs without health care. How those doctors treat me, however, is still shaped by race, no matter my class status. Would the same be true in Germany? Both logic and my personal experience tell me yes. But in order to verify this, we need to conduct studies similar to those done in the US. And here being comparative could mean to think intersectional, for example, by building on the strong European tradition of class analysis, but also considering race as a structural principle, that is race not as something one has, but something that indicates one's place in the system of global racial capitalism to use Cedric Robinson's term. The US, of course, also show us this data, that data is not everything, that change requires political will and political will often requires public pressure. But systematically studying the effects of racism on racialized communities is a necessary step in creating that will. The lack of such studies in the European context is not a reflection of a lack of need for them, but of a lack of collective will to conduct them. And I think that we have the racismus monitor now, not because racism is a new phenomenon or even because it's on the rise, but because of decades of work by racialized communities. In other words, those targeted by racism are both expected to prove its existence to those perpetrating it, and it is understood that they will only be believed when supposedly neutral institutions verify their experiences. The usual reaction to overwhelming evidence that racism is prevalent in a society is for those in power to say, well, let's study it and see if it really exists. This is obviously problematic. Nonetheless, the systematic study of the impact of racism on a society is also a first step in moving the discussion to societal patterns away from individual perceptions. And this relieves those targeted by racism from the indignity of having to recount painful experiences again and again to a hostile, skeptical or indifferent public. And it reminds this public that the changes that are required are structural, not individual. And that responsibility for these changes is collective and does not lie primarily with those targeted by racism, but with those embedded in racist structures. And that's actually all of us. But again, not all of us have the same positionality within these structures. And it is fundamental to acknowledge these differences and the different levels of responsibility deriving from them. And this is again a point where we can learn from comparative studies and from transatlantic discussions on race and racism because black feminist theories, theorists have thoroughly deconstructed the negative perception of difference baked into Western modernity and have shown us that the way out of this is not the denial of difference, but their honest exploration. To come back to the purportedly neutral institutions trusted with producing and disseminating knowledge, let's not forget that academia in Germany and the rest of Europe was and is not only a site not welcoming to circulating theorizations of race and racism, especially when those theorizations come from non-white scholars, 
but rather it is a site that was and is actively hostile to recognizing the value of these theorizations, not to mention acknowledging their relevance for the European context. Attempts to point to the ongoing relevance of race for European identity formations, usually by activists and scholars of color, are frequently framed as an enfor enforcing an Americanized political correctness meant to silence necessary critiques of migrant communities and their supposed innate sexism, anti-Semitism and homophobia. The idea that there is a structural racism that shapes European societies is inherent to them rather than a sporadic reaction to behaviors of racialized others has been rejected almost wholesale by continental European scholars, policymakers, media, and white progressive activists for decades. So if an understanding of the workings of racism is necessary for the very survival of those targeted by this racism, and if this knowledge is actively excluded from institutions of knowledge production, such as schools and universities, then the result will be the exclusion of racialized people from these institutions, since their presence brings into the open an exclusiveness that can be denied if we are all the same, that is white male middle class, or at least imagined to be the same, that is if the norm everyone is me measured against remains white male middle class. Again, difference is either vilified or denied, not explored. I enjoy working at a US university, but that is not the reason I'm here. The reason is that I absolutely could not have done the work I'm doing had I stayed in Germany. My doctor father told me at some point that if I wanted a job at a German university, I needed to work on something other than race. And of course, he was absolutely right. I often meet with amazing young students and scholars of color at university in Germany or other parts of Europe, and it's absolutely heartbreaking and infuriating to hear them describe a hostility towards their work and often towards their very being that does not seem to have lessened over the last 30 years. So before we enter an academic discussion of the merits of the study of racism, we need to acknowledge the active resistance of European academia to this field of knowledge production. And in order to understand this resistance and more importantly to overcome it and implement necessary changes, we need to be comparative. We have to pay attention to national specifics, but we also need to address how they fit into a larger structure of racism denial that is central to European identity formations. And the tension between the specific and the general is of course in no way particular to the topic of race and racism. It is present in literally every subject and field of study. Yet when I talk about structural racism in Europe, there's always someone responding that it is impossible to talk about Europe or European colonialism because national histories are so fundamentally different. As if I had imposed the idea of Europe on its fiercely independent nations, which I did not. I did not invent Europe just that, as I did not invent race or racism. In fact, Europe did. So again, our first question should be, why is there so much resistance against the not very radical claims that one, racism might not be specific to the US or South Africa or a problem of the past, and two, that this is something that can be studied systematically and compar comparatively. After all, no one claims that democracy can only be studied in Greece and everyone understands that the overarching structure of democracy plays out somewhat differently in different national contexts. And yet we can use the same term to describe them all because we recognize certain fundamental similarities that set them apart from other systems. And the same is true for structural racism, which is at its foundation, a transnational system meant to differentiate between Europe and the rest of the world. In the world we live in, it is impossible to separate race and Europe or to separate Europe and whiteness. So in the second half, 
on my talk, I will unpack this claim by exploring three themes. The difference between US and European forms of racialization, the specifically European conditions of global racial capitalism, and the potential of a truly comparative approach that is one that does not apply US models to Europe, but puts in conversation the different permutations of racial thinking to come to a fuller understanding of its impact on all our societies. Europe diverges from the US model of racialization in ways that tend to be misread, especially in Europe itself, as the absence of race as a relevant social and political category. So it might bear repeating that the idea of race was created in Europe. It is not that Europe is naturally inhabited by white people. It is not that scientists at a certain point decided to map out the distribution of races across the globe. It is that at a certain point, the concept of races was invented in Europe to the advantage of Europe. That is, Europe was claimed as the natural home of the white race. A race which was not only placed at the top of the racial hierarchy, it was granted a unique position in that to be white means to be human to an extent that can never be achieved by people of color who are not primarily human, but primarily less than human, that is never quite wide enough. The paradigmatic human is still a white European, and that is what allows Europeans to be colorblind. Europe does not have race. It is simply full of humans. Race only enters with racialized peoples who are simultaneously defined as not European and not white. Settler colonial states like the US are built on the encounter of Europeans and their racial other. An encounter that supposedly naturally ended in the implementation of the Europe made racial hierarchy. A hierarchy that despite variations was built around white and black as opposite ends. And this did not always require the presence of a population categorized as black. Black was always present as an imagined point of reference. In the German colonial context, for example, that meant for um, German possessions in the Pacific that Samoans were classified as almost white and Papuans as almost black, which produced different policies based on the supposed biological qualities of those controlled by them along the white to black spectrum. And that is also something that can uh, be found, for example, in the Latin American narrative of Mestizaje, which claims to embrace racial mixing, but systematically erases the African roots of Latin American cultures. The encounter between whiteness and its others was constitutive for every part of the world, except Europe, which seemingly remained untouched and unchanged. But of course, the process of constructing Europe as white started within its borders, immediately creating internal racialized others. Clear divisions and hierarchies were necessary to justify slavery and colonialism. They allowed to turn exploitation and genocidal violence into a civilizing mission, into a mission of conversion to European values and to Christianity. But the age of colonialism, the so-called age of discoveries, started with the Reconquista, the expulsion of Muslims and Jews from Spain physically and ideologically with their expulsion from Europeanness. The Europe that set out to submit the world could not be one that was racially and religiously diverse. And what we need to understand is that the world we are living in is still built on these foundations. Foundational for the modern United States was racial slavery and native dispossession and genocide. Genocide. In Europe, it is the racial, racializing of religion and colonialism that shaped the continental identity. But most Europeans believe that this history has had no lasting impact on the continent itself, that race matters everywhere but in Europe, and accordingly is brought to the continent only through non-white others, 
whose presence is always recent, temporary, and problematically upsetting a prior non-racial normalcy. Rather than being relegated to a subjugated position in society, racialized communities, no matter how long they have lived in Europe, are thus placed outside of it, assigned a permanent status of non-Europeanness. And any doubts about this claim should be dispersed by the treatment of Roma and Sinti, the quintessential essential European minority of color, who continue to face extreme violence, poverty, and exclusion, while being nearly completely absent as a recognized presence in contemporary Europe. Instead, they are framed as not only coming from another non-European space, but from another time, that is an idealized European past full of dangerous yet romantic gypsies, while ignoring a 500-year history that includes slavery and genocide. Roma and Cynthia have been in Europe as long as Europeans have been in the Americas, and yet they have been racialized throughout this period as not European. But there is hardly any theorization of this century-long presence process of exclusion. And this is another example where a comparative approach would no doubt be useful. I believe that both African diaspora theory and native studies could offer an urgently needed framework for an effective analysis of the specifically European patterns of racializing, racialization targeting Roma and Sinti which would allow academic discourse to catch up with the practice among European activists of color that have long made these connections. And I would be more than happy to say more about that in the Q&A. So there is a lot to study on race in Europe, but despite the current continent-wide rise of the extreme right and the geographic and intellectual origin of the concept of race in Europe, the continent still is marginal at best in discourses on race, in particular regarding contemporary configurations, which are often closely identified with the United States as center of both explicit race discourse and of resistance to it. Europeans tend to describe themselves as colorblind and often claim not to get race, usually after referencing a supposed American obsession with it. But what many Europeans perceive as an American obsession with race is a reflection of a fundamental shift in US society in the wake of the civil rights and subsequent liberation movements, which forced legal, social, political, and discursive changes, including the creation of academic disciplines like black studies, women's queer and ethnic studies. Those disciplines are still in a precarious position within the U.S. Academy, but nonetheless they manifest the irre irreversible entry of those who before had been largely excluded from universities and other centers of power, and their presence shaped how traditional disciplines approach race, sexuality, and gender. Something similar did not happen in Europe after the Holocaust and decolonization. The rise of the US empire and neoliberal multiculturalism in the second half of the 20th century coincided with the reordering of Europe into East and West, the loss of colonial empires, and then after 1990, another reordering, largely collapsing Europe into the European Union. The fall of the Soviet empire and the need to provide a common narrative to the formerly antagonistic parts of Europe would have offered the chance for a different understanding of European identity, one not tied to whiteness. This chance was missed, however, because the history of European colonialism was completely absent from post-Cold World War rewritings of European 20th century history, which combined post-fascist and post-socialist narratives into a Western capitalist success story of democracy overcoming totalitarianism. In fact, colonialism had to be absent from this narrative because the continent's colonial past fundamentally challenges the opposition of democracy and totalitarianism foundational to the new Europe. 
Europe's colonial empire shows that it was racism that allowed democracy and totalitarianism to coexist in all of so-called democratic Western Europe. And of course, plans for the European Union in the 1960s still included the colonies, which were considered part of the union in terms of free movement of goods, but not free movement of the colonized, who were certainly not considered equals to the citizens of the metropole. The after effects of this unacknowledged past are, for example, evident in the dominant narrative around the so-called refugee crisis, which really became a crisis only in 2015, when it began to inconvenience European nations. This crisis narrative frames Europe as an island of stability and prosperity surrounded by chaotic regions a Middle East increasingly succumbing to radical Islam and a permanently underdeveloped and war-torn Africa. The crisis originating in, this, in these regions is now reaching Europe, which is being pulled into it and needs to find imminent solutions for a global crisis originating elsewhere, as it so often had to do throughout history. This story is convenient, but it's ignoring Europe's culpability not only in allowing the situation to escalate to this point, but by creating many of its sources through the ongoing neo-colonial structures of racial capitalism favoring Europe's economic interests. The narrative around the refugee crisis is convincing not because it is true, but because it builds on a larger hegemonic narrative, that of Europe as a region and natural home of human rights and enlightenment, and the narrative of the current global community as one of equal nations whose relationship is regulated by international law. And while the United States usually counts on military violence to enforce this law, Europe, having learned from its violent past, is focused on negotiation. But these narratives are not reflected in the continent's migration or refugee policies nor do they address the ongoing economic violence Europe targets at its former colonies. In other words, Europe's supposed color blindness really is an enforced racial amnesia, which makes unspeakable processes of internal racialization and the ways in which they are inseparable from the after effects of colonialism and from neo-colonial economic structures that posit racialized communities increasingly as disposable populations. Race in Europe, as well as the US, allows for the division of the marginalized and deserving, hardworking and undeserving, lazy poor, or to use Ghassan Hajj's framework, those who endure and those who try to skip the line and demand special rights. Being proactive does not help the racialized poor often forced into mobility. To quote Hajj again, the ethnic difference of the immigrant becomes coupled with a social cultural difference based precisely on their perceived unwillingness to wait out the crisis like the rest of us. This reading is facilitated by a continental European Marxism still ignoring race as a fundamental analytical category, viewing it as a particular distractions from the universally relevant category of class, which of course is ironic since class is deeply racialized in Europe. Roma Muslims and Black Europeans are severely overrepresented among the unemployed, poor, and incarcerated. As a result, the economic foundations for the production of marginalized, racialized subjects remains largely unexplored, replaced by a culturalist discourse on racialized communities in need to be disciplined for their irrepressible, illiberal, anti-European tendencies. So in conclusion, there is still a lot to be studied and there's a lot to learn from existing theorizations of race. More than that, the systematic study of the impact of race and racism in Europe can contribute to the necessary expansion of existing theories. In Europe, the particular histories of colonialism, racism and migration create intersections and overlaps between in particular African, Muslim and Roma diasporas, 
which results in shared spaces, cultures, histories, and positionalities. This is a constellation that cannot be addressed only with theorizations of racism originating outside of Europe. However, it also cannot be addressed without these theorizations. And of course, my own work is situated at exactly this intersection, and I would be more than happy to say more about that in the Q&A. Because of the key role of race in the construction of European identity, it is impossible to integrate racialized communities into the existing model of Europeanness. What is necessary instead is its further destabilization, a destabilization that is already underway. Recent years have seen an escalation of global crises, 2008, 2015, 2020, this confirms that the current model is not sustainable. And it confirms that Europe will not be able to close its borders, isolate itself, and let others bear the brunt of the costs. Europe, not as a material space, not its inhabitants, not its thought traditions, but Europe as a concept needs to be dismantled to achieve decoloniality here and globally. A return of land, that includes actual sovereignty instead of exploitative post-colonial relationships would already fundamentally change Europe, Europe's economy, which is built on the model of prosperity at the expense of non-Europeans, which in turn is justified by a value system that ascribes Europeans more worthiness than non-Europeans. This in turn is based on a model of meritocracy that invisibilizes the violence of the colonial project. Europeans are better off than the rest of the world because they are more developed and thus more deserving. And this is a model that cannot function without race. This is the circular thinking that has to end for the benefit of the world, but also for the benefit of Europe. And this is the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Fatima, for this um, great lecture. And uh, the first thought I have is also to putting Europe in a global map and also um, putting uh, or it's putting Europe in a global perspective in per specific regard on race and racism. Um, I have many questions. You see that uh, everybody in the audience can still uh, write their questions. I'm receiving already first questions. And um, I mean, we, we gave you some questions and you laid it out very um, broadly on one hand, the historical context and how uh, theories of race and racialization can travel and can travel and what the uh, limitations are and also looking at the structures and also the structures of knowledge and the epistemologies we do need to refer to and to understand in order to address racism. So one specific question I have, and then I will look into the question because uh, there are many questions coming in. Um, in particular, as we are speaking here at the Dezim Institute, the German Center for Integration and Migration Research, and uh, you were talking about the African Muslim and Roma and Sinti diasporas, and from there to start. And so my question is, how could migration and integration studies contribute to the understanding of racialization of Europe? Well, I think by understanding racialization as a structural principle, not as a descriptive model, right? It's not about particular populations that are racialized as X and Y. It's about race as a structural principle that is foundational to capitalism. So basically using race in a, in a way similar to class. Or as, um, as Frank Wilson said, black is a positionality. So it's about positionalities. Um, and I think that is obviously something that fits into migration studies very well. But I think often, very often the idea in, in Europe is that class is a kind of analytical model and then race is 
treated pretty flatly without analytic analytical depth. And this is, I think, where um, we can a lot uh, learn a lot from um, Anglophone studies of racialization. Yeah. So, and, and, and this also you said in the lecture, so it's not of having a race, but instead of understanding race as a position and its, and its positionality and look through the study of also migration and integration, how people are positioned. Right, it's a way to structure society. So you can have a society that is perceived as completely white, but it's still it will still be part of this global racial system or a society that you that consists exclusively of black people, but it's still part of a global system that uses race as a structural principle. Thank you. Uh, while you're talking, I'm also looking at the questions coming in. And there are several questions on somehow they're addressing um, the whiteness of Europe, which you were also addressing in your talk. And it was also intriguing me to, to differentiate the settler colonial condition and making and, and to theorize it as an encounter, but making a difference to Europe as a continent full of humans and every other is less human. And um, so there's one question. It's a bit of a polemic question, but I like to um, uh, pose it here. So I have to be black and to study colonial history um, before I can study racism as a white male. So as we were talking about the positionalities, how does the positionality of the researchers um, is important to study racism? How is it important is your question? Yeah, is it, or to, to, to say it this way, is it possible as a white male to study racism, to put it very bluntly? Well, obviously, because there are a lot of uh, white people who consider themselves experts on on racism, and um, yeah, um, it's a okay, it's a polemical question, but I also think it's a tiresome question because white men dominate almost every field still. So yes, they can do that. That's ob obvious. So I I don't, I don't know. If there is a serious question behind it, but just to be clear, this system of global racial capitalism structures people into different levels of worthiness, putting white males on top. So the alternative to that, the dismantling of this system would not be to change the order and put white males at the bottom, blah, 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 something like that, but it would be an understanding of humanity that works without those hierarchies. And if we have a system such as that, then of course white males can study colonialism. In fact, what I hope white males would do is to study colonialism in a way that contributes for all of us to move to a system that dismantles this kind of, of hierarchy. So it's not that if you have a particular position, then you're lost. It's the acknowledgement, as I said in the beginning, of both the fact that we all are implicated in this larger system, but that we're not all implicated in the same way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so, um, I have one question here, which is uh, catching up with what you said at the, the end and specifically looking uh, at the years or looking at the formation of a European identity after um, 89, after the fall of the Soviet Union. And the question I hear is, where do you see the main differences between Western and Eastern Europe with respect to racialization and understanding of racism? Um, well, yeah, I think there are 
there are a lot of differences within um, the larger context of Europe. So whiteness was important to Europe to create a kind of coherence that was important for the imperial project. But whiteness in itself is not divided equally across Europe. So the East as well as the South have a different position in the maintenance of whiteness in part because they are away from the center that is closer to the borders of non-whiteness, which means that they have to reaffirm their whiteness in a way that is different than um, Scandinavians, for example, have to do that. So that already, so again, if we see race as a positionality that already puts Eastern Europe in a different position within whiteness and the different histories of capitalism in the West and socialism in the East, as I said, are created into a larger narrative that now claims that the socialist East um, had a delayed development towards the kind of ideal Europeanness because it was under Soviet control. So this narrative of Eastern Europeans, in fact, being more racist than Western Europeans because they are basically less developed. So in response to that, Eastern European scholars have um, created theorizations of Europeanness that I think are really interesting for um, Western European discourses in which they are um, not that often integrated. And that also means that there is, I think, in some ways more interest in the East to look at the potential intersections of post-socialist and post-colonial studies in various ways. So, um, and because we were talking about East, Eastern Europe and also bringing in, um, and or what I would like to bring in is the question, um, uh, because I have one question here. How do you explain anti-slow racism in German history or that one of the victims of the NSU was a Greek? And how do you frame Europe as a continent or do you acknowledge the building hierarchies also in Europe south north? So it's about exploring the, the differences within Europe in this east west, but also north south, but also with the history um, of uh, racism against um, Slavic people on one hand, but perhaps you can also extend how anti-Semitism is in regard to the formation of European whiteness. Because uh, if you look at the history of nat national socialism and bringing in that history into a post-colonial analysis of Europe, what, how does it affect our understanding of whiteness in Europe? In Europe? Well, of course, this is a really, really huge question. And part of it is, um, I think, the, the different, the kind of the paradox is that we, when we talk about race and racism, we often look at what Europeans did outside of Europe. So racism and, and South Africa, racism in the US, but not so much what happened in Europe itself. But Europe is the point of origin of both the theories and the practices of race. So um, in some ways, the, the racialization of religion was very important in Europe in constructing that whiteness. And once this whiteness was exported, that was not as um, as relevant, then it became um, in part this project of conversion, right, to Christianity. But um, of course, what you had in Europe was the need to establish Christianity as um, quintessentially European. And of course, that was structural for anti-Semitism, namely dealing with the internal others that were created by this assumption that Christianity equals Europeanness. So what are you doing 
with those that don't don't fit that model. And of course, Europeanness. Well, one thing about that we have to understand about theories of race that there was never a point in history where even the biggest racist or race science ever agreed on what exactly defines a particular race. There was always disagreement. It was always not quite clear. There was never one definition of whiteness and blackness, but that is not a weakness of the system. It's a feature of the system because it allows for control, right? Slavs in some contexts can be white and others maybe not. So that allows power to play out in particular ways internally within whiteness and externally towards non-whites. But that's different than, for example, anti-black racism, because blackness is not always on the outside of whiteness, it is always the opposite of whiteness and so the opposite of humans. So if you compare, um, if you look at the relationships of so-called Germans and Slavs, you have a different discourse than if you look at Slavs and black people, but those discourses are not either separate or contradictory. They are part of a larger logic. So tensions within whiteness um, are, again, are not something that puts into question the idea that racism plays out in Europe. It's, in fact, a sign of that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for answering that huge uh, question and also to addressing the tensions of uh, whiteness um, and also to show how complicated it is to, to address it. And I have here now a question um, from uh, Naika Furutan. Um, because I have to check several channels here. And she was writing, Dear Fatima, thank you very much for your inspiring talk. Could you perhaps say something about the connection between racism and migration in Germany? If you look at the racist killings of the last decades, 90% of them hit first generation migrants. Do we need to better link migration research and racism research or separate, separate them more? So, it's a bit of a question which I pose, but also reflect upon the, about the relation to each other and thinking through or separate them. Well, I think both. And that's kind of what I, I mean with this, with this comparative approach, right, that you Comparative, being comparative for me does not mean never to look at specifics, but to always, you know, keep the larger context in mind. And I think in some uh, situations, it's important to separate the two, um, but in others, it's necessary to combine them. And uh, the issue of of migration as a threat is tied to an idea of separate spheres as the normal that again is tied to idea to ideas of race because it claims that it's important for people to remain in their separate spheres because they are fundamentally different, right? So that difference becomes a threat. Migration between people that are considered the same is not considered an issue. Mm. So, and, and also to be very clear, um, saying that race is a structural principle does not claim that other forms of systematic oppression or discrimination are absent or less relevant. But again, it's uh, migration is a process, right? Migration is an activity that happens. It is not race, that is not what race is. Race is a concept. So we also have to, I think, be careful to um, keep that in mind. So migration is something that happens within the larger structural principle of race. Mm 
Yeah, I mean, you you said it that there is a lot of to do, and I think it's so interesting to have that conversation. What needs to be done? Also, theorize racism within Europe and in the European nations uh, in its several contexts. Um, I have a question here, um, and actually, there are two questions, um, which are more a bit more getting it back about our own positionalities within the academic system. And as you also said, you at the beginning of your talk, you were not able. Oh, I don't know if I should proceed talking with my and addressing my question because uh, I think Fatima El Tayeb is offline. Um, so I wait until she is back before getting back to pose my question. Um, I hope she's back soon before we had, it was quite, it went very quickly. There she is. Are you back? I am back, yeah. Good. I waited with my question uh, until you're back. Um, so I have two questions and both questions go a bit into the academic structures and environments where we're working. And also, as you said, that... Uh, the work you're doing, your research you're doing at the moment, it wouldn't have been possible to do all that research within the German um, context. So I will pose two questions which we are getting, which I got from the audience. The first question is, what advice can you give to a person of color in Germany who wants to enter the German academic circles? That's the first question. question. And the second, Dear Professor Dr. Fatima El Tayeb, I'm a British person of color living in Germany. How would you proceed if you had been, like me, a senior lecturer in a German university for over 20 years and now want to write the PhD on structural racism in university, universities in Germany? Who would you ask to be your PhD supervisor? Would you write in English or German? And how would you then try to integrate your findings into the university and create a study program specifically dedicated at looking at racism, post-colonial, etc.? So on one hand, we have questions on a personal level, but perhaps it also gives you the possibility to explore a bit because you said um, that specific studies in the U.S. have entered uh, um, U.S. American academia, but that is missing. But what kind of changes you may see in the European context? Or, or where do you see the potentials? Well, in, in some ways, I'm not really very qualified to answer those questions, of course, because I'm not part of the German academic system. Probably you could say a lot more about that. But... Um, I think with regard to the first question, the advice I would give any person of color entering um, German academia is to be sure to have a, a solid network outside of the academic structures. Because it's not, um, it's not at all that there aren't a lot of brilliant scholars doing that work in Europe or in Germany, the problem is that they are not integrated into the academic hierarchy. So that leads to a kind of stagnation because certain conversations, certain discourses have to happen again and again and again. Um, well, so basically, um, coming back to the US, what happened was a massive transformative movement, right? The civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s and, and, and inspired by that um, and by the anti-colonial movements uh, in Africa and Asia, um, black liberation, women's liberation, queer liberation, anti-war movements. So what they did is to change an academia in the US that looked very much like that in Europe, very white, male and limited. Um, so it was this massive outside pressure 
that produced those changes. And it was a very difficult process. And what I think was essential to it was this short period um, when US politics, even conservative politics, were open to that. I think affirmative action was essential because what needs to happen are material changes, right? And those changes rarely happen because those in power understand that it's right and they're generously share. It's often something that needs to be implemented and enforced. So I do think that's absolutely something that Germany needs. It's not, it doesn't necessarily mean that it will happen, but I think that's what would be necessary um, because otherwise, um, there is, as I tried to characterize in the, in the beginning of my talk, there is just this immense pressure on scholars of color who already suffer from a lack of networks and resources to do the kind of work that cannot be done by individuals. So yeah, um, with regard to the to the second question, um, I don't know. I would probably go to check in with with Daisy because I think you all know a lot more about that. And I think the institute is also part of a change that is happening. So there's not a transformation, a radical transformation that as the one that happened in the US, but nonetheless, there is a slow change simply because I think, um, I'm not sure if, if, if German academia or European academia necessarily realizes, but it is out of step with the global discourse. So there's a mounting pressure to adjust to that. And that means certain changes that, um, that haven't happened for decades. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's also about um, material changes because I think there are a lot of people um, like the ones who pose the questions who could do the work, but they need to have the resources. Thank you. Um, I also would like to move a bit towards a whole field of monitoring, which is kind of the, um, I don't have the English word, but the German word is Anlass. That's why we are having also the conversation. And it's a huge question how to do also empirical social science and as well quantitative research. So um, you said in your um, talk, you were talking about that racism is a matter of life and death and it's a matter of the distribution of life and death. And you gave one example looking at mental health, but I'm interested what kind of data you see which should be uh, looked at to set up such kind of a monitoring system? That's the first question. And the second question is also to give us your insight, what you think about um, how these, how this evidence can influence politics and policy making. Um, because if you look at the US, there's a large body of this kind of um, having these kind of data, but also if we look at the UK, and we just recently had in the UK the publication of the civil report, and there's a huge discussion whether that civil report was actually contributing to an advancement of anti-racist policy making. So um, the, that question is uh, going more into the relevance of that kind of monitoring and as well as you know if we look at the UN and and uh, the uh, demand that Germany should um, 
gather uh, data on question of uh, racialized inequalities, but uh, Germany doesn't um, have this kind of data because it's also forbidden due to um, ethical reasons. So how to navigate on one hand through the ethics of doing this kind of research and uh, uh, that sense, but on the other hand, um, what is your view upon the relevance of this kind of making this kind of data? Well, okay. Uh, of course, this is also a very, um, a question that has so many um, elements. Maybe just to start with the ethics, because that might, from my perspective, be the most um, simple. Because to me, it, it addresses this this um, imagine. Well, the the difference between a so called blindness to certain things or neutrality and denial. So I don't know if I, you know, if I, speaking from my own perspective, when I was still living in Germany, knew if I was looking for an apartment and I said my name or people saw my face, then I was out. So I don't know where the ethical issue would be for people actually to, you know, collect information or on my perceived race because it's not you know it's not somebody calling me black that's the issue it, the racism is the issue right so 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 the idea if you don't talk about it it doesn't happen of course is a complete nonsense it's the opposite it just makes sure that there's no vocabulary to talk about what is happening, right? So, so a lot of my work is about this this issue of of naming and how naming something is really the the taboo. So there's a certain practice, and of course, what's happening right now in Europe, which I think is also inspired by the U.S., is this this push towards towards erasing race. You know, like the French did with their constitution, exactly because race becomes a more explicit issue right so um so i don't think with with collecting this data i, I don't really think that there is a is an ethical problem because it assumes that there's a certain kind of neutrality towards race or an absence of racism that's not there um in terms of data, it's not really my field, of course, but and it's it's really complicated because on the one hand, again, recent developments in the US show how important it is to have a certain agreement on something that we could call facts. On the other hand, of course, we know that facts in itself mean nothing unless there's a narrative around them that makes sense to a particular society. So again, if we look at the knowledge that already has been collected, one of the most important European scholars of the 20th century, I think, is Stuart Hall. And, you know, we can go to Stuart Hall to understand how people deal with facts and ideolo ideologies and with regard to race specifically, but also more in general, how facts fit into the stories that we tell ourselves to make sense of our lives. And there's a certain tension because if objective facts don't fit, then our first impulse is to ignore the facts and stick with our story. So just having the facts is not changing anything, but it helps. So I think we need the data because, for one thing, as I said, it just shows something that many of us already know. So it's, it can just be convenient to be able to point to that data if you have a conversation with something. It was, you know, it's it's kind of ridiculous to have a conversation about the existence of racism, for example, but it's better to have that conversation where you can say, well, look at that data, rather than um, going in circles, as I said, in a way that leaves it per uh, personalized. Um, and if there is a political will for change, 
having that data is really, really important. So we can see in the recent US history, for example, how um, the last government, the Trump government, which was one that pushed, and it is not only connected to Trump as a person, but it pushed, it made racism to a certain, to a certain degree acceptable again in a way that it wasn't since the 1960s. And part of that is a attempt to erase what I have talked about, erase of the presence of in particular critical race theory within academia. So this is clearly seen, this kind of knowledge production is seen, seen as relevant and is seen as a threat, which I think for us means that this is something that is worth protecting because it clearly does something useful um, at the same time, with the new administration, the Biden administration, what we see is that with this um, new budget proposal, what it draws on is a lot of data on racial inequality. So, of course, there is still, you know, a back and forth, should that be done, but there is no... Um, there is no disagreement that the data exists. There are just people who say, well, we shouldn't collect that data because who cares? So, um, yeah, I don't know. On the one hand, I think it is really, really important to even have that. But then it's also really important to know that this is just a first step. But as I said, the first line of defense by those in power usually is to say, well, who knows if, if that's true? We have to study it first before we can do anything, which is tiresome. But if we are at that point, then we should grab the chance and produce as much data as possible, I think. And that, I don't know, I'm sure there was a lot more to your question, but I forgot what else <laughs> there was. Yeah, but thank you, thank you very much. Um... To, to giving us your view on also the, on one hand, the limitation, but also to, to make very clear how gaining data and doing empirical research is connected to the question of having a narrative or create a narrative. So this is kind of um, le leading me to my next questions and and also what I said at the beginning, because if you look at history, and history is like the discipline of talking about a narrative and, and also um, contesting specific narratives. And from what I also learned that social sciences and sociology is many times ahistorical and um, how you think how both these approaches of I would I could uh, say from what I've learned from you today, it's important to bring that together because if you don't think about the narrative on one hand and on the data which you want to gain, um, if you don't think that together, then um, you might run into a problem. And um, so actually, this is more a command than a question. Um, we're moving towards um, the end, but I have one question here, which is a very simple question, or it seems to be a very simple question. Um, but I'm also curious to learn from you what your answer is. The question I have here from the audience, what is the difference between discrimination and racism? Simple question, huh? <laughs> um, for one thing, I would say discrimination is a particular form of racism. Or not all discrimination is racism, but all racism is not discrimination. So again, racism is a, is a structuring principle. It's in some way a narrative and the material manifestation of that narrative discrimination in that sense is both limited 
because it doesn't cover everything that racism is, and both more general because discrimination can um, play out in contexts that have nothing to do with racism. The commonality would be also trying to be very simple that the kind of worldview that came out of modern Europe with the Enlightenment was one that is fundamentally based on a binary model. So of opposites, right? White, black, male, female, West, East. And so there are always two options and basically one is good, one is bad. And then there is a combination of all the good qualities and that those are centered very much in Europe or if it would be, if you look at all the different categories, as I said, it could be, you know, white, male, middle class, able-bodied, straight, and so on. So the idea is to have binaries, but all these binaries work together to create a worldview that again, turns difference into opposites and makes them threatening. So discrimination in some ways is built on this larger model. So if you're perceived to have qualities that fall on the bad side of the binary, one result would be discrimination, then that would be justified with, you know, the inherent inferiority of whatever quality you have. So the, the two are related, but but they are not not the same. And there's also no 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 hierarchy in that necessarily right i'm not saying racism is more serious than discrimination i'm just saying those are um two different things that sometimes overlap but not always and when i was um i was focusing kind of on in some ways on blackness because i think there's a unique role that both blackness and whiteness have in this hierarchy is opposite so this is something that plays out everywhere so anti-black racism is present everywhere. And that is something that, um, as I said, has to be kept in mind when we think about racism as a structural principle, because you can say, what about places where there are no black people? That's, it's not about black people. It's about the, the idea of blackness and whiteness. So I, I um, try to make, make that differentiation but you have, I don't know if you look um, at the, the structural discrimination of particular groups, then you often see how it fits into this larger system that I call, um, or that really Sarah Robinson calls um, global racial capitalism. So, um, for example, the, you know, gender, I didn't talk much about gender, but it's part of this system. Um, the idea of disability and able-bodiedness is part of that. So they are also in some ways connected to racism. But again, that doesn't mean that they are they are the that they are the same. But they are also not something that's that's completely completely separate. I don't know if that um, made any sense, but I try to <laughs> try to make sense. Yeah, it it was very helpful to to also to differentiate um, between the different categories or categories of inferiority to which you had been referring to. Um, I'm, I, I'm a little bit um, uh, handling a lot of questions which are coming in and uh, listening to you at the same time, and um, I'm looking through the questions. Most of the questions we have done so far, and. Um, I don't know. Can you take another question? I mean, sure. I'm not sure. Sure. But... Okay. Um, so I have one question here, and it's getting back also to 
it's getting back to the US, but also the question of human and being non-human. And the question I have is here, do you have any evidence that in U US police training, black men are portrayed as non-human? Isn't that rather embedded in society and maybe rather selective in who joins authoritative positions such as police force? So the question here, so far as I understand, are people within government institutions such as the US trained as seeing, for example, black men as non-human? Are there any studies or any evidence you know about at looking at this kind of material? Well, if I understand the um, the question correctly, I, I would um, absolutely agree with the person who asked by um, clarifying that I don't think that there's something specific about the training of police in the US that focuses on black men as predators, but it's embedded in society as a whole. And yes, there are studies, there are studies that show that um, black kindergartners are treated as a threat. You have literally um, black kids of five, six years being handcuffed by police because what is embedded deeply in society is the idea that black people are not quite human which is also implies that black children are not treated like white children, for example, as innocent, as a need of protection, but as a threat, less of a threat than a grown up, but still a threat. And yes, there are a lot of studies that show that um, both black girls and black boys are disciplined much more in schools than other groups are that there is a underlying assumption of aggressiveness that is um, acted out through uh, violence towards black people from basically from the very beginning, right? There are also studies that show that um, that infant mortality is much higher in the black community. And again, there are studies, as I mentioned, the one in the beginning that take out other factors such as, you know, general health or economic status to see if there's something else that contributes to that. And so, yeah, I mean, I don't think, you know, this whole idea um, about the police as a racist institution Yes, but it's because it's part of a racist society, right? So, and, and also what also happens is, again, it's about positionality. So um, black police treats black people worse than they treat white people, right? So it's not only about, you know, again, what what is the race that you have, but what is your position? So I think, um, um, I think, this whole movement here um, right now about defunding the police is not about, or not only about abolishing the police, but about transforming society away from a punitive model that often uses race as a justification. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a, most societies and especially important in democracies, the police force is part of the state in a very particular way because there's an agreement that police can do what nobody else can do, namely use violence against civilians to the point of killing them. And the understanding is that that comes with a particular responsibility. And that is an agreement from which black and brown people are systematically included excluded so some people say oh this is a this is something that needs to be fixed and other people say no that is at the very foundation of the system so the system needs to be changed yeah and the 
very interesting question is how to change the system. I mean, you gave us already some idea in comparing the US and Europe. And um, I think it'll be interesting to have that conversation again in two years or five years uh, where we are standing. So at this moment, um, I would like to wrap up and um, say thank you very much for this broad lecture to giving your insight and also to think through a comparative approach to what's happening on, on the globe, on racism and race, and also putting Europe and, and specifically also Germany in a global perspective. Thank you so much for um, initiating the conversation and also being the first, uh, giving the first lecture in our series. I also would like to uh, uh, ask Jihan to come in uh, because he's kind of the host here and also giving some words and as he also has some more information. So Fatima, thank you very much. My applause. Actually, we have to have some applause uh, to, to give some more noise. And I hope to welcome you one day in Berlin so we can have like a real audience and lecture with real people in a real space um, but we're also very happy that we were able to have you here although you are actually right now sitting in california um, we are in the evening it's your uh, midday and so it's uh, it's it's really nice it's possible to do it this way thank you very much so i hand thank over you. to you so thank you uh, uh, fatima she's gone now no She's still there. Anyways, uh, um, it was a pleasure to um, have her here, and I, I guess it was the right decision uh, that she uh, starts uh, our lecture series. Um, there's nothing more to say. Thank you to uh, Noah. It was really a pleasure to to see how you moderate and how you navigate through this really really tough questions. There is she again. Fatima, it was a pleasure to have you uh, at our lecture series. And I think I, I know that we will stay in conversation. So thank you uh, also in the name of the Datsun Institute. Uh, it was a really uh, great and astonishing talk. Um, for um, everybody else, our next lecture series will be um, with Dr. Um, Caroline Rapp at the 14th of June about the question of how to measure racism. So uh, until then, thank you for everybody joining us today. And yeah, stay healthy. Bye. <laughs>